a practice of close to 40 years now. Yes. And uh, how do you think the process of trial has changed over these 40 years? Now, see, during the past few years, particularly after the uh, opening of 21st century, there has been good reform. And now, Supreme Court and even executive, the prime minister, the law minister, they all and all concern have been taking cognizance seriously of the fact that justice delayed is justice denied is becoming a reality in India. And comparing to other countries or even from an average point of view, our justice system is crawling. It is, uh, you know, with snail space, it is not able to catch up with the requirements. And therefore, delayed justice results in denial of justice uh, invariably. So we must quickly decide as to how with promptitude we can dispose of cases and now setting up of the fast track courts and uh, uh, enhancing the you know size of uh, judges number of judges etc and expansion of courts and all these steps are being taken by the government also in coordination with the supreme court and the high court and i, I must say that if you look at kasab's case it was disposed of in a quick two years time within two years the trial court wound up the and handed down the judgment, which is an achievement according to me, because 1993 blast case took about 15 years. So I think now we have taken serious note of the fact and all concern are working on this. And I think this would be one achievement if we can still further cut down the life of uh, pending criminal cases. The reason I asked you this question was because when we asked Mr. Jepalani the same question, he said that the skills of cross-examination, for, for example, are dying. Younger lawyers are not as adept. Well, that's right. You see, now, th therefore, I, through you now, by this, I would send a message down below to the law students as also to young lawyers. That you see, the art of cross examination is a greatest art. And that is what you must learn. Because it is, as I said earlier, that exploration of truth is the mission of a trial. You know, quest of truth, as we call it, both in criminal investigation as well as criminal trial. The ultimate aim is to get to the bottom of truth so as to be able to do justice. You can't get to the truth, you can't do justice, as I said. Now, how can the truth be arrived at during the trial? Now, the next question is that the truth can only be arrived at during the trial by the art of cross-examination. You see, if a witness is lying, he would continue to lie unless you grill him unless you cross-examine him with a great amount of skill. We have been doing it. I have, as a cross-examiner, found out that many a times it so happens that the witnesses are, for reasons very difficult to uh, prima facie understand, trying to hide truth, trying to color truth, trying to exaggerate the facts. And therefore, it is the skill of your cross-examination that would make him speak out what he seeks to conceal. And therefore, as, as Mr. Jait Malani said, you gave me the reference, uh, cross-examination is the most vital aspect of a trial. And in truth-finding or justice-dispensing exercise, it is the cross-examination which plays vital role. And these days, if the lawyers feel that they are not bothered much about learning cross-examination, I think they are making a serious error. How do lawyers, young lawyers, learn cross-examination? They must sit in the court and see if there are some good lawyers known for their cross-examination. Uh, they should be, uh, you know, watched. You know, how do you get the truth from the witnesses? The young lawyers must sit, try to learn. I have seen that when we go to the courts, often the courts are crowded with law students, with junior lawyers, even with media people. Sometimes media, young boys and girls who are also law graduates and who are interested in law are also thronging. And they all watch how do we cross-examine. Good cross-examiners must be very carefully watched. And the art of cross-examination is a very delicate and a very important art, as I said. So young lawyers will have to devote some time to pick up a les few lessons from the uh, learned seniors as also from the books. So I want to go back again and ask you uh, the decision to take up criminal law. How did that come up? Yeah, when I, when I took law, well, I thought that criminal law was such that uh, it could be, it does not need any background. You know, we know what is happening, the street brawls or, you know, anything like that happens. So, right, the criminal uh, case, the criminal law comes into play. Police stations and then magistrate's courts and all that. So, for some few years, 
I was attached to magistrate's courts for some time and then petty cases like you know from a simple case of assault and uh, some accident cases or some uh, other cases of uh, various and the various acts. But then when I started working in criminal law, unfortunately no, no option was left for me because I moved so fast that I couldn't go back. If I would have had some breathing space that well now I find that criminal law is not very interesting, not very encouraging, not very responsive, then probably I would have thought of something else. But then I did work on constitutional law, I worked on human rights law and I have done quite good work on human rights, on constitution, etc. Uh, it is not that excellent. See, when we when we cross a certain stage after a few years, then all laws, any law in this country, you know, become relevant for you. In corporate law, civil law, it is not that I am totally ignorant about other branches of law. I have in fact uh, taken up matters, but not very many, few of them, uh, in various other spheres of law as well. So your life has been under threat as well. Uh, I, there was no threat in fact, you know, there was some misunderstanding and in fact uh, there was no attack on me as such. See, that's the problem. The attack was on the rear side wheel of my car. Somebody, some miscreant just fired there and then wanted to run away to, to scare me. And I knew the reason why I was to be scared because I was going too rigid against certain section of society. You know, there is no, no direct threat to me. And nothing like that because I have not invited any enemies. Of course, some people, I have great number of admirers. You will be surprised to know that I am receiving calls and even if you type Googles and see my performance, you will find it is there on the net very much. You know, that uh, fair trials abroad based in London and various other international legal organizations, they are all very good to me. They are very close to me. We have worked with them. I have worked in London for about five years from 1997 to 2002 for Nadim's extradition case. Then I have worked for Anand John in United States in Los Angeles court. Then I have worked in South Africa, in Portugal, in UAE, in France, in many countries. And I have had good experience of, you know, knowing local people, local laws, local lawyers, their, their uh, you know, uh, choices and so many things like. So it is not that there is any th uh, imminent threat to my life, but then there was some misunderstanding and then some people came and did tell me also not to reveal, sir, please don't go against us. What is the, see, the question is that we are, people are misunderstanding that criminal lawyers running risk their life. Criminal lawyers never run to risk their lives so long as they are only confining to their briefs in the courts. I have been advising to my young lawyers' teams, always to my juniors, to young lawyers and young students. Look here, if you are practicing criminal law, there are some very challenging matters that come to you where underworld may be involved, you know, where uh, uh, traitors may be involved, where terrorists may be involved. These are very dangerous areas. So you have to be very careful. But if you take up their briefs, don't be scared. You are only a law officer who is trying to put their case across in the court, nothing more than that. Please don't identify yourself as their friend. Don't go close to them. Don't interact with them because they may land you in difficulty. So at least as far as I am concerned for the last 20 years or more probably, I have not been interacting with my any clients. They are My juniors are there who are briefing or other lawyers come and they brief us. And then if you are briefing your clients also, please understand that there is a line is to be drawn. You don't have to mix up with them, don't become friendly with them, don't in interfere in their activities, don't question them anything about it, don't try to learn about their secret of their trade. You confine yourself to your brief, take the instructions, present their case in the court and then wait for justice to come. It will manifest on the, on the efforts that you will put in and on the material that is before the court. If you can restrict to this, you will have no fear at all. A related question to this uh, moral courage that is required of criminal lawyers is the uh, you are required very often to take up unpopular causes. Yeah, they, you know, it happens. You know, in your in your by your stride, everything comes. There may be popular causes, there may be unpopular causes. You see, you must not be tempted to take popular causes, nor you must be hesitant in, to take unpopular causes. You see, you, the, your your choice of selection of work will not be based should not be based upon this criterion whether the cause is popular or unpopular. Sometimes 
the unpopular cause may warrant more your intervention, your participation for delivery of justice. And on the other hand, sometimes a very popular cause may not need you to intervene or uh, you know offer your services. So that is not the yardstick for the purpose of deciding. What is the yardstick you used to decide? The so yardstick is that you must know that yes, the, here is a person who has come to you and he believes that he, he needs to be assisted to receive justice. This is the fundamental cause. And if you feel that yes, he should be assisted through the court of law, through the process of law to achieve, to receive justice, please go ahead. Help him to get justice through the court. That's all. Another topic entirely, sir. Special crimes like, say, uh, the NDPS Act or uh, uh, trafficking, immoral trafficking, and um, uh, let's take terror, terror legislation. What is your experience of uh, trial law, tr tr conducting trials in each of these? No, areas? naturally, under special laws, there are special provisions. And under special provisions, the investigating agency, the prosecution is equipped with greater powers than what they are in general, isn't it? So therefore, it's difficult to defend them. Because, you know, when you are defending a person who is charged of offenses under special acts where special powers are given, then there are greater privileges to the prosecution and the challenges are higher. You know, you have to show your skill with more of effectiveness, more labor, you know, more intelligence, more wisdom, more, more industry. So it is a greater challenge to take up matters under special acts like TADA, POTA, MOCA, you know, NDPS Act, etc., etc. I have tried all this during the last 15, 20 years. Any experiences that you'd like to make? A lot many, you know, under TADA. In fact, TADA was grossly misused and we successfully demonstrated and got it uh, repealed in the year 1995. In fact, I was very instrumental personally in getting its repeal, uh, the act repealed, because uh, in the year 1995, uh, there was a lot of UN cry that the act was more in its misuse than in use. It was not uh, a good piece of legislation for a healthy society, a democratic society. So the law was repealed, TADA. And similarly, even under many cases, well, when there are stringent uh, provisions of law empowering investigating agency and equipping it with greater powers, then there is greater risk of abuse. So therefore, the Supreme Court repeatedly analyzes and uh, spells out that uh, greater caution is required for the purpose of ensuring that such acts are not uh, misused. The question of burden of proof is also important. Is Pardon? Is the question burden of, of proof. Yes, burden of proof is always... You see, the onus is upon you if you are booked under, say, NDPS Act. And uh, bail becomes difficult. 